Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Thank you for allowing us to be out of, uh, out of Bible study for a couple of weeks. Even though we were back in town last week, we felt like we needed to take a mental health day and get a little bit of rest. I don't know that we got a lot, but we'll see. Any... How's the new computer working, Kate? Good. Just okay. trying to readjust the camera. Okay. Munchkin sleeping? Mm -hmm. Okay. No. Any any questions uh, from uh, Exodus? No, Exodus. Ezekiel <laughs> starts with an E. And they didn't they didn't give me any stupid drugs, so this is all me. Yeah, but <laughs> if it's Exodus, if I knew it was Exodus, I could have done this the last two weeks. You, you could have are not doing it on Ezekiel. Like you could have done it just as well as Exodus. <laughs> Any questions on uh, Ezekiel? Okay, according, according to my no, notes, like, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Ezekiel. Now that we're studying Ezekiel, Ezekiel keeps popping up in all kinds of places and other things I'm doing. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. kind of how it works. It's good, called bad sense. Ezekiel is a is a, a significant book in the Old Testament that gets overlooked by the majority. At some point, I want to do Jeremiah, but I don't like Jeremiah a ton, and I think it's harder than Ezekiel. Sometime I'll do it. Should the Lord tarry? Okay, no questions. Uh, according to my notes, we are in. Uh, Ezekiel chapter, we're, we're in the section, the judgment of, of God, and chapters 20 through 24, and we are beginning chapter 24 this evening. Does that fit with everybody else's <laughs> recollection? Yay, I got notes right. Good. So when as we move into chapter 24, we are moving into a section, uh, we're concluding a section, of a of the series of judgments on Judah. So when we look at at this section of 20 through 24, it's a whole series of judgments on on Judah. And uh, it's the third one. The previous judgments were seen in 4 through 11, 12 through 19, and now 20 through 24. So it concludes that section. In the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, write down the name of this day, the very day, the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. So the ninth year, the tenth month, and the tenth day equals January 15th, 588 B.C. I love that we can be that specific. That's taking the calendars that we know and converting them to a 365-day calendar and so forth. It works out to be January 15th, 588. It was on that day that Babylon began its final attack on, on, uh, on Jerusalem. So the final attack lasts two years. But the attack has been, the, the siege of the city, really, has been going on since 605. So, you know, we're, we're, we're coming up on September 11th, and right after that we entered into the longest war that the United States has been on, and Babylon was, was fighting Judah longer. So you get a sense... I, I bring that up so you get a sense of the of the time frame that we're talking about here. This was this was the entire lifetime of some people. 
and it was a significant event in their life. It was the day it was on also the day that Ezekiel had been warning the Jews in exile about for over four years. For four years he's telling them, the day is coming. No, it's not. It's not going to be. It's coming. No, it's not. This argument had been going on for, for over four years. We can see this uh, event referenced in 2 Kings 25, 1. And in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth of the month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works around it. You also see it in Jeremiah 39, 1. In the ninth month of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. Or Jeremiah 52, 4. And in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works all around it. So imagine what it was like to be a citizen in Jerusalem watching as Nebuchadnezzar's army built ramps up the 18 or 20 foot high walls. They built earthen ramps. They built wood ramps. They built anything they needed to in order to get over the, the wall. They built, they built we, we have archaeological uh, uh, remnants of great big um, cantilevered battering rams that uh, like the Romans would use. The Romans didn't invent those. Nebuchadnezzar's forces perfected it. These were these were you know multi-ton, huge trunks of trees that would swing back and forth and pound against the gates, and it went on for two years. So you know, and, and, and they built up these ramps, and, and it took two years to do that. So you know it was significant of a of a battle, but it was also a torturous one because the people inside were hearing the. The battering ram, boom, boom, for two years. So you can just imagine how this would wear on you over time. It's a pivotal day in the history of Israel, and the only parallel to that day is when General Titus began to lay siege on Jerusalem for the Roman army in 70 AD. That's the only parallel, and it took about as long. General Titus took a little over a year for him to finally take out all of Jerusalem. I don't know what, I can't, I really can't imagine what that would be like. Because we're not talking about hundreds of square miles. We're talking about a few square miles in the walled city of Jerusalem, what's today referred to as the old city. As Those walls must have been incredibly tough. Yeah, they, they were they were incredibly thick and there were there were houses in the wall. So you had multi layers of walls. One of the apart one of the apartments that Randy and Dottie lived in, in in Jerusalem was actually in the wall. In the ancient wall. So you've got the outer wall, you got some empty space that they ended up building houses in, and then you've got the inner wall, and in some places the wall was three walls deep. So Nebuchadnezzar played the long game, you know, because he had to bring in dirt. He had to bring in rock and all that kind of stuff. So he's got slaves hauling that stuff in and building it up. Meanwhile, the the Judean forces are throwing rocks and spears and, and hot oil and all that kind of stuff down on them. Nebuchadnezzar didn't care because he was using slaves for that. But, you know, that, that was just more to build up on the bodies of the slaves. But that's the way it was. And it takes more than two years for this for this attack to be finished. Meanwhile, the Judeans that are there and the and the exiles that are in uh, in Babylon are saying, "Yeah, this is not really going to work. It's it, God's not going to let that actually happen." Until He did. <laughs> Chapter twenty four, verse three. And utter a parable to the rebellious house and say to them, Thus says the Lord, Set on the pot, set it on, 
pour water in also and put in pieces of meat all the good pieces the thigh and the shoulder fill it with choice bones take the choicest one of the flock pile the logs under it boil it well seethe also its bones in it so God tells Ezekiel here tell him this this little parable highlights the reality of of people being holed up in Jerusalem that they they're not going to be protected many people believe that by being in Jerusalem with the gates closed they'd be protected and so you can think about it these great big battering rams come up and the first sound against the door is probably deafening in all of of uh, Jerusalem and they say, don't worry about it we're it's it's gonna hold see it didn't break and with every pound it didn't break and they get a little bit bolder as they get hungrier and hungrier because now nothing is going in or out of Jerusalem and they're just completely cut off while all this this pounding is going on while all this this noise of them building the 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 siege ramps and so forth are going on and so Ezekiel tells them the story look it's like you're being put in a in a hot pot you're the choices you're the ones that are left you're God's chosen and you're in a hot pot put some extra wood under it boil it that's that's the picture that's being uh, that's being leveled there. God tells them through the parable that they're ultimately not going to be safe. They're not going to be protected. The pot in the parable is a reference to inside the walls. God's God's remnant. Well, that's the wrong word to use. God, God's chosen that still remain in Israel will not survive this. It's going to be the end for them. Therefore, that says the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose corrosion is in it, and whose corrosion has not gone out of it. Take out of it a piece after piece without making any choice. For the blood she has shed in, is in her midst. She put it on the bare rock. She did, not, she did not pour it out on the ground to cover it with dust. To rouse my wrath, to take vengeance, I have set on the bare rock the blood she has shed, that it may not be covered. I think this passage is, is uh, these verses are r rather interesting. This, these verses and later in 19, uh, verses 19 through 14, I'm sorry, 9 through 14, Ezekiel begins with reference to the sovereign Lord and what he says. Ezekiel is making sure that the exiled people, hearing his prophecy, understand that the sovereign Lord, it's actually God who is doing this to Israel. He's emphasizing Nebuchadnezzar is working at God's behest. God commissioned Nebuchadnezzar to do this. And you say, well, that sounds counterintuitive. They're God's chosen people, but God is, is sending their enemy to go and hurt them. Well, it's not really counterintuitive because God's doing that because they failed to live by their covenant. God was doing what he was obligated to do. He's, he's truly the one in control. And he's determined that things are not going to go well for Jerusalem. Exactly like he promised Moses. Exactly like he promised David. Exactly like he promised Solomon. Exactly like the, the Jews agreed to live under. This should not be a surprise to anyone. But it was. There's nothing that they can do. They can't change God's plan. It's fixed. It's going to happen. God de describes Jerusalem in this parable as a pot encrusted or covered with rust. There's nothing that can be done to hide the rust. There's nothing that can be done anymore to hide the corruption of the people. It was all exposed by God. In keeping with the analogy of the parable, the meal in the pot was no longer edible, and it had to be poured out. This is a reference to the removal of Israel from the land for a violation of the covenant with God. God will shed blood as Israel is taken into exile. I, if, you, if you look for the golden thread of redemption or I should say the red thread of redemption. This is a, this is a, a, a set-up reference to it, where 
where God is, is again showing that blood is going to be shed for the payment of sins. Now, this doesn't provide them eternal salvation. This is what people that don't get saved end up with. It's kind of an illustration of what salvation will, uh, what the lack of salvation for those God hasn't chosen will be like. Thus, or I'm sorry, therefore, thus says the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city! I will make the pile great. Heap on the logs, kindle the fire, boil the meat well, mix the, in the spices, and let the bones be burned up. Then set it empty upon the coals, that it may become hot, and its copper may burn, that its uncleanness may be melted in it, its corrosion consumed. She has wearied herself with toil. It is abundant corrosion does not go out of, uh, out of it. Uh, its abundant corrosion does not go out of it into the fire with its corrosion. On account of the, your uncleaned lewdness, because I would have cleaned you, and you were not cleansed from your uncleanness, you shall not be cleansed any more till I have satisfied my fury upon you. I am the Lord, I have spoken, it shall come to pass, I will do it. I will not go back, I will not spare, I will not relent. According to your ways and your deeds, you will be judged, declares the Lord God. That's a pretty profound statement God makes toward, Israel, toward Judah, um, generally in, in Jerusalem specifically. Not only will God, or not only did God, direct Babylon to attack the city, but it's going to, to destroy the city, the bloody city. The picture continues the, the, or the parable continues the picture of the meat that's well cooked, indicating slaughter of those left in the city. God's going to consume them all. This attack will, in effect, cleanse the city of the filth of her inhabitants. In verse 14, God makes clear that since he has said it, there's nothing that can be done. It will come to pass. He's not going to relent. Judgment is coming. Israel had resisted every attempt God had made in the past to correct and to return to the path God had told them to walk in. God, God had grace and patience on the people of Israel, but now his patience had come to an end. The punishment was here. I don't ever want to be in that position where God's grace comes to an end. God gave them opportunity and they didn't avail themselves of it. And so punishment was coming and now he was past forgiving them. Time was up, up and they were going to be they were going to be in difficulty. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, behold, I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. Yet you shall not mourn or weep, nor shall your tears run down. Sigh, but not aloud. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban and put on your shoes. On, put your shoes on your feet. And do not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. This is one of the most difficult passages to read without emotion, when you recognize what God is telling Ezekiel he has to do in his ministry. God tells Ezekiel that the love of his life, his wife, is going to die that day. Your wife's going to die, you can't mourn. You can't publicly mourn. All Ezekiel could do was sigh, but not aloud. He was not to do anything that would let people know he was mourning. Why would God do that? Because that's, it was a picture of how God was not going to mourn over Israel because Israel was so evil at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I love the way Randy describes 
the Bible as the story of the the, the narrative of two love stories of uh, the Old Testament between uh, Israel and and God the Father, the resulting uh, so, uh, son of that relationship, then the relationship between the son and the church, and of course the uh, God disowns or divorces the the wife for a time. Of course, we know that to be the period of the Gentiles, and then uh, comes back to her for eternity. I think it's a perfect. I think it's a perfect picture. And here, Ezekiel is basically living out the the parable of that divorce, that separation. And and he, he he had to suffer the pain of losing his wife as an illustration for a people that had rejected God. God was asking a ton out of Ezekiel in his ministry. I can't ever complain about what goes on in my ministry when I read Ezekiel and what he had to go through. It's very sobering. Ezekiel goes on, So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at evening my wife died. And on the next morning, I did as I was commanded. And the people said to me, Will you not tell us what these things mean for us, that you are acting thus Ezekiel prophesied in the morning then by night his wife was dead as commanded he, next morning he continued his ministry he continued to tell the people what God was doing without any public mourning and the exiles asked him well what does this all mean surely they knew his wife died that's why they're asking the question but he had to be the he had to be the the guy that was obedient to God and not to himself that's asking a ton i don't know that i got that in me but ezekiel apparently did special empowering by the holy spirit yeah i think that's it's really the only way you do that I don't think you can do that in your own power. No way. Then I said to them, the word of the Lord came to me. Say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the, bri the pride of your power, the delight of your eyes, and the yearning of your soul, and your sons and your daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword. And you shall do as I've done. You shall not cover your lips nor eat the bread of men. Your turban shall be on your heads and your shoes on your feet. You shall not mourn or weep, but you shall not uh, uh, you but you shall rot away in your iniquities and groan to one another. Thus shall Ezekiel be to you a sign. According to all that he has done, you shall do. When this comes, then you will know that I am the sovereign God, the Lord God. How hard was that for Ezekiel to go through? And you know, I, I don't get the sense that that the exiles really gave a whole lot of rip about it. They, they didn't really care what he was going through. What he sacrificed for the ministry that God had called him to. But he stood there and said to them, listen, this is what's going to happen. You failed to be obedient, so God is going to punish you. You're going to be, ultimately, we know from history, they were removed from the land for 70 years, but they never regained their own autonomy. God is still punishing Israel. Any questions on that section? Mm -hmm. I don't have any right to complain about what my ministry is when you read Ezekiel. 
So God took Ezekiel's wife as not punishment. No, not not uh, punishment as an illustration. Uh, illustration. Yeah, an illustration could, for Israel. Yeah. Yeah. He couldn't okay. mourn, and that's exactly what what the illustration yeah. was. God was not going to mourn over them. Okay. Mm. That's hard to swallow, isn't mm. it? Mm -hmm. Very. Oh yeah. We we yeah. see we see often in scripture that God uses people yeah. in ways that seem to us to be unfair. Like the man born uh, lame. Mm -hmm. Jesus said he was born that way so that I would have the opportunity to heal him so that you would know right. that God sent me. Assuming the guy's 20, 25, 30 years old, that's 30 years of relative misery to be a an example to be an illustration for God. Here Ezekiel's wife has mm -hmm. to die to be an example mm -hmm. for God. Yeah. Life ain't so bad. Oh, Eze okay. Ezekiel's examples were rough to begin with. What was it? 366 days on one side and 40 days on the other, mm -hmm. tied up and eating bird seed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and cooking his food on dung. Mm -hmm. At least God changed, I relented and let it be cow dung and not people dung. Right. But, I mean, God asked an awful lot of Ezekiel. Yeah, when, when you consider that Ezekiel turns 30 and God commissions him to be a prophet, when he thought he would be a priest at 30, God commissions yeah. him to be a prophet, and from the beginning tells him, they're not going to listen to you. You're going to have a, min yeah. a ministry that nobody will respond to. Uh, God, w why am I going? What's the point? It's it's Ezekiel to me is a is a an incredible figure in history. I hope I get to spend a lot of time with him in eternity. And I want to apologize to him that he had to mm -hmm. go through that so we could learn a lesson. Yeah. So let's let's uh, <coughs> let's uh, do the principal thing here. From that, from e Ezekiel's wife being taken by God as an example, what principle can we use? Can we derive from that for us today? And God has the right to take or use anything we have for his glory. Okay, that's a theological truth. That's true. Turn that into a principle. When people don't listen... You can beat a horse, lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Yeah. When people don't listen, they're going to pay the price. Yes. How? But how does that apply to us? Sometimes Same way. things happen to us as an example for someone else and not necessarily because of anything that we've done. I would go as far to say our entire life actually is an example for somebody else in so, or, or for us in a way because God has planned it. Mm -hmm. And as the master logistic, log, logistics <laughs> guy <laughs> That guy. Yeah, the logistics guy. Um, he's got all of that planned out so that the things you go through mm -hmm. maybe you go through them so, I shouldn't say maybe. The things you go through, you go through so you have the opportunity to help somebody else. Or to help yourself later on. I gave first, Second Corinthians. Say that yeah. again, Mary, you were garbled at first. That, that's my favorite verse. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, I believe. Comfort one another with the comfort wherewith you have been comforted. Yeah. Isn't that that principle? Yeah. 
So God takes us through mm -hmm. things that seem mm -hmm. catastrophic at times mm -hmm. so that we have the opportunity to use that to help others. Mm -hmm. that's, what, uh, that's what our life is. And I don't think any of us ever will go through what Ezekiel went through. Even with the, with the garbage that's going on in our society today, we're way better off than Ezekiel was on his best day. <laughs> but God's the guy that plans all that out. And God's the guy that, that orchestrates all of our life so that we're capable mm -hmm. of being that for someone else. Mm -hmm. Mary, what was that reference again? Second Corinthians 1. I'll look it up and make sure I give you the right actual verse. Because I can, I can mess that up. Oh, dear. It's not one, two. No, it isn't. Well, you can... It's so one, four. One, four? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort where mm -hmm. which we were, where we ourselves are comforted by God. Yes. One, four. Yeah, you really got to start in three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our, of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort mm -hmm. with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Mm -hmm. That's a good You can add to that First Peter 2.21, which says... For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his footsteps. Mm -hmm. Jesus was the example, so we are also to be examples. What verse First, is that, Linda? First Peter 2.21. Oh, I wrote one. I don't know where I was, but at some point somewhere... I was teaching and we came up with the, the idea that sometimes when God asks us to go through something, we, we talk about going around the mountain and we have to go around the mountain again because we maybe we didn't learn it the first time or we go through it again and we say, God, I thought I learned this. And then we come to the conclusion, well, maybe we did learn it and we're going through it this time so that someone who was watching can figure out how to do it for themselves. Yeah. I think it's clear when you go through mm -hmm. Scripture that God does that <coughs> all the time. Mm -hmm. And it would be improper of us to conclude that God hasn't planned out our lives like that. When mm -hmm. you think of the people that led you to Christ, you think of the people that you led to Christ, how God intertwined all those things together. It's, uh, to me, quite remarkable. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop there, even though we have a little bit of time. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.